Hi, Mike Gibson and Tim Henry coming to you virtually from TCT 2020. Tim, you know, the C and TCT this year kind of stands a little bit for COVID. Uh, and you really are leading the charge in understanding how COVID is impacting MI care. Talk to us a little bit about your registry. Yeah, it's really an, a timely topic, Mike, because, you know, uh, first of all, COVID has disrupted all of our lives. But from cardiovascular standpoint, it has clearly affects cardiovascular medicine in many different ways. And uh, number one, we know that patients who have cardiovascular disease are at higher risk of, of dying. Number two, we know that if patients admitted to the hospital that probably 15 to 30 percent of them have an elevated troponin. Mm -hmm. And troponin is a very uh, strong predictor. Number three, sort of the unintended consequences, we know that there's been a 20 to 50 percent reduction in STEMI activations and in cardiovascular admissions because people have been scared to come to the hospital. Yeah. And then finally, a very unique part of COVID is that um, patients who are COVID positive and have ST elevation. It's a very unique, it's not your classic STEMI. And what we knew from social media early on, reports in March and April was these patients um, were uh, unique. And so we very rapidly put together, I think one of the most unique parts of this uh, is this was a true collaboration of all interventional cardiologists in North America. Mm -hmm. Strong support. It was sponsored by Sky and very strong support with the Canadian Association of Interventional Cardiology and the ACC Interventional Council really work together. And you know, Mike, that doesn't always happen in medicine. And no. the fact that we were all on the same page was, I think, uh, tremendously important and exciting for me. Yeah. So what, what we were able to do is in a very short time, we basically in a month, we were able to put together a protocol, uh, a central IRB, uh, a, a data form that we all agreed on. We had a, a strong steering committee from all three groups. And so then we developed what we call the North American COVID myocardial infarction registry. Now, one of the key things, there's been five reports in the literature of ST elevation. And, and the key findings are, have been that more frequently, there's no clear culprit, hmm. okay? But Not a surprise, right, given the yeah, microthrombosis downstream, yeah. Yeah, 100%, and that happens with, uh, with the flu as well. But that's ranged from 5 to 50%, so that's a pretty big uh, variety. We know that that's higher mortality, but the range in the five studies is, is 12 to 72%. So that's like a big range for mortality. Likewise, there's a higher percentage of in-hospital development, and there's um, more thrombotic, appears more thrombi, in, including the microthrombi that you talked about. And then there's, finally, there's a lot of controversy on how to treat these people. And so I think we put guidelines out, uh, again, uh, SKY, ACC, and American College of Emergency Physician in the end of March and April that said, we, you should go to the CAFA that these are the best patients to go to CAFA because a high percentage will have, um, uh, you know, a thrombotic lesion that you need to fix. Uh, and even if you have normal coronaries, uh, not best to be treated living. So that's kind of the background of this. And our goal was to create this registry so that we could understand the demographics, the clinical findings, and then hopefully use those results to um, design best care. Um, and so it's been really successful. And I think an important couple of key things, the inclusion exclusion are anyone who is COVID positive or suspected with or suspected. elevation okay. or suspected. Yeah, it's a key thing because, and we'll talk at the end a little bit, Tony Gerschlich presented data from Europe yesterday that's complimentary, um, but there's some key unique things of the cohorts to understand. And anybody and then have any clinical and very broad symptoms in terms of clinical symptoms to go along with this and we we had no exclusions so you could get in the trial if you got an angiogram if you didn't get an angiogram if you got lytics if you got pci if you had normal coronary doesn't matter st elevation and covid positive 
So I think that's a, a really important part of, of the thing, of the, the trial of the registry to understand. And for this one, and uh, what we did, and I think you, you probably, you have the slides, I hope, but there's three comparator groups initially. So the first group is COVID confirmed. So, and, and you know, uh, people out there know that many of these patients, at the time you're going to the lab for a STEMI, you don't know yet. You know, many of these patients are suspected and you don't find out till later. Um, some know, you know and are already positive and occurs in the hospital, but a good uh, majority of them you don't know. So for this analysis, we did two, three, a very unique uh, um, uh, statistical analysis. We looked at COVID positive patients confirmed, and there's about 171. So that's the largest group to be presented so far. In fact, it's as big as the other five trials already put together. Mm -hmm. Number two, we have the COVID suspected. So this is about 400 patients that were suspected, but turned out not to be COVID. Huh. And then for number three, we had a propensity match group from the Midwest STEMI Consortium, which is a large consecutive cohort from Minneapolis Heart, Prairie Cardiovascular, Iowa Heart, mm -hmm. and uh, Christ. So that's got 20,000 patients in it. So it's a good comparator group. And uh, currently we have uh, about 75 sites in US and Canada, but we're still looking for sites because we want to get to 500 COVID positive patients. Tim, how and, does someone get involved? How does someone uh, get engaged? Where do they sign up? Yeah, they can email me and we'll send you the information. And it's really simple, Mike. We have a central IRB and basically, um, you know, for a lot of sites can be up and running within two weeks. Great. And it's a very simple form that's designed similar to the CAF PCI form, but, but a little supplemented for COVID. And so we want to make it easy. We want to get a lot of sites involved. And, and I, that's an important point for your audience. We're still looking for sites, especially high prevalence sites, uh, because we want to have the more patients that we have in, the better we're going to be able to make insights into this. Is there a so website, this, Tim, where people can get Yeah, it's on the Sky website. Sky website, okay. And it's also, um, uh, if, if people, I am uh, I'm in the National PI with two other people, um, Payam Dagai from uh, Canada, and then Santiago Garcia from the Coordinating Center in Minneapolis Heart. But if they send me an email, um, maybe we'll put the email on this for my email and they can contact me directly too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here's the key findings for this. And this is the, uh, the initial results and we will certainly have a lot more to come. But there's some really important things. No differences in age and sex. So we have three groups you're comparing. But a strong ethnic difference, Mike. This is really interesting. There is a huge predominance of uh, Hispanic and Black with ST elevation. Really? Now, okay. Yes. And we know that's been true in deaths from COVID, too. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also, uh, as we get more sites, especially in um, uh, Arizona and New Mexico, there's also going to be a Native American or we're calling it indigenous because mm -hmm. you have both Canada and the United States. There's also a, that, a predominance there, too. Is that a, due to a biologic difference perhaps in the endothelium? You know, this is kind of an endotheliitis yeah. uh, in some complement activation interacting with the coagulation scheme. So is there something about ACE in the endothelium that's uh, different by race? You know, it's a great question, and it's something we really need to sort out, but it's really true. So if you look at it, let's just compare the COVID positive or suspected. The um, uh, Blacks are 27% positive group, only 11% in the suspected group. Hispanics are 24% in the positive group, only 6% in the suspected group. And those are contemporary groups, right? It right. should be the same. Right. And then the other group that's really uh, predominant is diabetics. 44% of the diabetics have, um, or 44% of the cohort had diabetes compared to 33 and then 20 in the, in the propensity mass. Hmm. And this has also been shown with influenza, hmm. that with influenza, 
uh, when you have an increased risk of, of STEMI, and it's a predominance in diabetics too. So right. I, think, I think those are some fascinating, we, we definitely need more information and are gonna specifically look at the ethnic part of it, but I think this is why a registry like this is helpful. Very important, Tim. Now the diabetes, was that independent of obesity? You know, obesity and diabetes kind of run together, and we all, we've known that obesity is a risk factor for bad outcomes in COVID. So could you tease out obesity yeah, versus it's, diabetes? It's an growth? absolutely critically important question. And I'll tell you, we haven't done the full, um, uh, you know, multivariate analysis yet, but here's what I'll tell you. The BMI in the three groups was equal. Oh, really? Okay, so it does point more towards diabetes itself. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a fascinating first step. And obviously the multivariable analysis will tell us in more detail. So that's the baseline, uh, some key on baseline characteristics. In terms of the clinical presentation, re again, really interesting things. So first of all, they're more likely to present with unusual symptoms. So dyspnea was the most common thing in 58%. And you can see this is why it's confusing, right? Very because tough you, is it the COVID or is it your heart attack? Yeah. Right. And know. then number two, 50% uh, had uh, infiltrates on chest x-ray. And, you know, infiltrates for uh, a normal STEMI, um, lots of people have gone away from even checking a chest x-ray, right? Because sure. there's, it's so uh, unhelpful. But obviously here it is. But then a really another interesting finding, there was no difference in out of hospital cardiac arrest, but there was a strong increase in cardiogenic shock. And those two don't always separate. Usually they go mm. together. Yeah. And this is also similar with the European data. So 20% uh, uh, of the cohort of the COVID positive patients presented in cardiogenic shock. And the EFs were lowered. So the uh, average EF at the time of the cath was 45% compared to a, um, the uh, uh, propensity match, which is 52. So definitely wow. lower EFs, definitely more cardiogenic shock. Mm -hmm. And then an interesting thing, a little bit higher in hospital presentation, but not as much as we thought. You know, the initial report, the New England Journal from the um, New York area, half of the patients developed their STEMI in hospital. Yeah. And so, you know, that's more to come, but it wasn't that high from this. Then the next, I think the next key part is the treatment strategies. Tim, can I, I hate to interrupt you. Yeah, go ahead. Other, but, you know, obviously as a patency guy, was there any difference in the initial presentation with respect to artery patency? You know, we've heard that this is a disease in a microvasculature in, in many of these patients. Did you see that somehow reflected in the data that they have more open arteries, but perhaps uh, it's explained by microvascular thrombosis? Have you been able to look at that? Yeah, ab it's absolutely going to be increased, and we'll sort it out a little bit. So here's the nuances of that question. Number one, 21% of the patients did not undergo an angiogram. Hmm. So that's not as high as the New York group, who was 50% didn't, but it, it does mean, again, that means we're, we're successful. We're trying to get a broad group of, of ST elevation COVID, whether or not they go to the cath lab. And it's important distinction because the, your, the uh, Gershlik paper only had patients going to the cath lab. Ah, uh, I see. So this is a, an important 20%, right? A lot because, of entertainment bias in that. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Okay. Now we, because they weren't in the cath lab, I don't know how many of them had normal coronaries, how many of them were just too sick, how many were too old. Uh, we have to, and we're going to get that information. We're in the process of it. Got it. So now let's go, who went to the cath lab? And if you went to the cath lab, 20% had medical therapy, and it, which is higher in the COVID positive group. And I think that reflects the people that you're talking about, which are no culprit. Yes, interesting. Yeah. We're, we have an angiographic core lab, and that's in process yet. And so that it, I'll emphasize, Mike, you know, again, this registry, we put it up very quickly. We've got the data very quickly, but we did the data cut on su last Sunday night. I had the data on Monday. We sent in the slides on Tuesday. So wow. you, you, can, I, you can see that there's a lot more to learn. And, 
and we, and we have queries to the sites and you know we'll it will get better and we have more patients coming in every day but so this isn't that so then definitely more people with normal coronaries 20 percent were treated no angiogram 20 percent of the with angiograms had medical therapy but now let's also look at another number very little lytic used even though this was Canada and the United States, and there was a lot of discussion, should we use lytics or not use lytics? And only 6% of the group was treat, of the group with an angiogram were treated with lytics. So it was a very low use. And um, I think that reflects people realizing they need to go to the cath lab and figure it out. <clears throat> and I think if you have normal coronaries, obviously, it, you know, this no culprit group are not gonna benefit from lytics either. So I think, the, the best way to handle these patients, go to the cath lab. A lot of them are hemodynamically unstable, the 20% cardiogenic shock. And I think you go to the cath lab, look at the coronary anatomy, fix the artery when you need to, um, but then also be there to be able to support the patient. And the differences in uh, primary PCI of getting it um, were um, 82 in the propensity and 70 in the um, so it's still, a lot of patients got primary PCI. Mm -hmm. And another really important thing is the door to balloon times between the three groups are not different. Oh, well, that's, a, that's actually good to see because I would have thought some of the diagnostic testing would slow things down, but I guess it may have slowed things down equally. So it's interesting. Or compared to your register, older data, I would have thought it'd be slower. That, that's I, so 100% true. And we're going to start through the one, uh, an important missing piece of data right now is chest pain onset to arrival. And the data from uh, other places has shown that that's longer. I would um, expect, yeah. Yeah. And so I'm pretty sure that will be, but right now that's, um, you know, that's a hard number to get, especially COVID, right? Because when did your, you didn't start with chest pain. If you have, if you're just winded or short of breath or dyspneic and coughing, who knows? Yeah. Yeah, and it's also might be covered a little bit because more of these people presented in the hospital, so we'll have to sort that out. And then the final thing, uh, and not to take because I don't want to take too much of your time, but the w then we got the clinical outcomes, which I think are really important. There definitely is increased mortality. The mortality in the COVID positive patients was 32 percent. Wow. Right. At what, what time point, Tim? A month? In, in hospital. In hospital? 32% mortality? Yeah. Oh, holy cow, that is high. And then if you compare it to the COVID suspected, it was 12%, which is kind wow. of intermediate. And wow. in, the, in the propensity matched, it was 6%. Wow. Wow. This so, uh, is absolutely mind blowing. Yeah. Well, remarkable increase in mortality and uh, not as high as some of the literature, you know, the, some of the literature, the initial uh, paper from New, New York said 72%. So it's not 72. And then I'll tell you, uh, and I'm careful about saying this, but if you look at the groups, the no cath group, the medical cat therapy arm, and then the PCI arm, the PCI arm had the lowest mortality and it was more like 12 or 13%. But that's selection bias, and we need to be careful about that. Sure. Well, and do, do you know, Tim, do you have enough information to know how these people died? Did they have a cardiovascular death, or just like a lot of COVID patients, just have a PEA arrest or asystole? Uh, that's a common way they die. Is Was that the way they died, or did they die of respiratory complications? Was it the cardiovascular disease, or was it the COVID that led to those deaths? So it's a critically important question and we're gonna have that. And the other thing about this that we don't have yet, we have an angiographic core lab and we're gonna be going through these angiograms and look because there's this um, cases that have been presented where um, patients come or COVID positive are very uh, thrombotic, like clot that you just can't get rid of in our normal uh, ways. Mm -hmm. So we'll, I can't give you a percent about that yet. And we do have the cause of death, but we haven't had time to analyze it yet. But going well, along- You know what I'm gonna say, Tim, you know, I'm gonna say you need to look at the blush too, at the micro yes. yeah. We will do that 100% because I think 
this issue of uh, microthrombi is really important. You yeah. know, initially, they called it myocarditis. Um, but uh, Renu Varmani, we had a nice session yesterday on COVID. Uh, beyond the NACME, we had a, there was a COVID uh, session at TCT that was outstanding with Dr. Fuster and uh, Mamas Mamas and uh, Renu Vermani. And um, it's pretty clear that in, in what Renu said in her pathologic series, or what, they didn't see myocarditis at all. What they saw was microthrombi. Yeah. And, and so it, I think it raises for interventionists, if you come to, I think going to cath lab is important um, because a lot of these patients are gonna have lesions that you need to fix. Yeah. But if you have normal coronaries, it's important to realize this is still probably a thrombotic process and not, right. not as much myocarditis. That's a real critical distinction because if it was myopericarditis, you might be scared to be aggressive with anticoagulation. Uh, right. But if your instinct is that this is uh, thrombotic, you might want to be a little more aggressive with uh, the parenteral anticoagulation to help clear the microvasculature. Completely agree. And we definitely have to sort it out. And to the point about increased thrombotic, there was also a marked increase in stroke. So the stroke rates in the three groups were 3.4%, 2% in the COVID suspected, and in the typical MI is what you'd expect, 0.6%, right? Stroke is not common in STEMI. It's, it, and, and so to have 3.4%, um, you know, that's a seven times higher incidence of stroke than you'd expect. Again, goes along that this is a thrombotic process. Tim, how so, aggressively did you guys test uh, the COVID, the presumed COVIDs? Did they have one test that was maybe. negative or serial test? I mean, could some of them turn positive later? Very important question. So uh, this is interesting. When we did this, we specifically took the suspecteds because I suspected they would have intermittent, out intermittent um, outcomes, which is exactly what you saw. Um, and part of the reason is I uh, have no doubt that a few of them are false positive or false negatives. False negatives, right. Yes. But I also have no doubt that there's a delay, even if you're suspected. And again, there wasn't a delay in door to bloom, but from just from symptom onset to Ah, is a so different that's, thing. That's why they're doing worse than maybe your registry, your, your kind of contemporaneous cohort. But stroke is odd, you know. Stroke that, is odd. It's, odd. I think that's thrombotic. And you saw uh, the stroke in the 2% the in, the, in the COVID suspected make me think that some of those were probably, everybody in the, in the PUI group had a negative test. But uh, we all know that uh, there are patients who have had two or three negative tests, or you're so sure they are, and finally they get a bronch and, and their lungs are positive. So we know that there are false negative, and almost yeah. for sure there are. What percentage, it's going to be hard to know. I suspect that's the case. But that, that yeah. stroke thing made me think, uh, think that that may be the case. I agree with you. The delay in presentation could explain some of the other things, but not the greater risk of large right. vessel thrombosis, which is odd. Right. Well, Tim, this is amazing, amazing work you guys are doing. I'm, I'm so thrilled to hear what you're finding out. And how long are you going to keep this up? Are you going to keep it up throughout the pandemic or... Do, or you know, how many patients do you have? How many do you think you're gonna end up with? Yeah, perfect question, Mike. And because I think that's the real, the good news is, um, I, first of all, the collaboration has been fantastic um, with both Canada and uh, with the ACC and Sky. So that's what we should do. We should all be working together. And uh, you, I know you believe that strongly, but um, it doesn't always happen. So this is a good thing. Number to we're really trying to get North America, so we're targeting Mexico. And we and there's a big group in Brazil that has a lot that we'll probably collaborate so that we'll have a North America, South America. And that will allow us to look regional differences in the United States, as well as country to country differences. Another really important thing for me, we've seen personally a difference from the first two months, like March and April were one thing, 
but the way we treat these patients now is quite different. And so we're gonna look at changes over time. And then specifically, we'll look at ethnic differences. We're gonna look at the patients who develop it in hospital. We're gonna look at the no culprit uh, patient population. And then uh, we'll look at um, uh, patients who are transferred. So we haven't yet uh, got into that concept at all. So there's a lot to do. We really need sites out there to be, and we're gonna really go to uh, high prevalence areas in the United States with hospitals that had a lot, and we're gonna really say, we really need you to be in NACB. Um, we've made it very simple. And so for those that listen to this, um, please contact me. Um, my email is tim.henry at thechristhospital.com, and, and we'll make that available to people. Um, or go on to the SKY website, uh, or TCT uh, will have a, bit, a way to get a hold of us because we want our goal is to get to 500 COVID positive patients. And then I think a lot of these questions that you brought up, which are very important, we'll be able to answer. Because I think COVID is not going to go away, Mike. I think we need to know how to handle these patients. And uh, the more data that we have, uh, the better we're going to be able to do that. Well, the sad thing, I, I hate to say this, is that vaccines under current development are intended to reduce the progression of symptoms. They won't prevent COVID. Uh, yeah. Antivirals uh, won't prevent it. Uh, antibodies may attenuate the course, but we're still going to have a lot of COVID cases, and um, this is not going to go away. There's not going to be a magic bullet. People need to wear their masks. Uh, to prevent the transmission. It's going to be a multi-pronged approach. But Tim, I'm just so proud of you guys. This is truly amazing. You know, really what we've learned here is that it's when people come together and collaborate uh, that we can really answer a lot of these important questions. And, uh, you know, the Brazilians are a great example of that. They've done great work. Uh, great to see you leading the charge here in the U.S. I'm thrilled to hear that you guys are going to work together, hopefully with the Brazilians, because they've really figured out how to collaborate. Uh, so great work, Tim. I'm, I'm really proud of you guys. Really proud of you. Yeah. Personally. Great. Thanks, Mike. You know, this has been a, uh, a, a tremendously gratifying uh, uh, work because uh, you, you can make a difference in these people's lives, for sure. Right. right. Well, thanks, Tim. Thanks for joining us. And thanks to all of you out there in the audience for joining us virtually here this year for TC 2020.